was not metaphorical or allegorical fire. It was real, literal fire. Psalms 11.6 says, Upon the wicked he will rain snares, fire, and brimstone, and a horrible tempest. Psalms 140 verse 10 says, Let burning coals fall upon them. Let them be cast into the fire, into deep pits. Matthew 13.49 says, The angels shall sever the wicked from the just and cast the wicked into a furnace of fire. John 15.6, many other scriptures I could give you, but it's real literal fire. And just to give you one verse to prove to you it's fire, in Revelation 9.2, during the tribulation time on the earth here, when the bottomless pit is opened, it says there arose a smoke, and our air and sky were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. Well, it could have been a metaphor or metaphorical fire to produce real smoke. It takes a real fire to produce real smoke to darken our sky. You see? And in Luke 16, he wanted a drop of water to cool his tongue. So if it, if it was just flames of mental anguish, why would water suffice? And that's why Jesus warned. You know, there's 46 verses in the Bible where Jesus talked about hell. And 18 of those verses are about the fire of hell. I understood that I was down deep in the earth. I just understood that. But there's 49 verses that talk about where hell is currently located. I'll just give you two. Ezekiel 26, 20, Numbers 16, 32, and 33. But there's 49 verses, and I just understood that I was down deep in the earth. Now, after Judgment Day, death and hell are delivered up and cast into the lake of fire, Revelation 20, 13, and into outer darkness, Matthew 25, 30. But down deep in the earth, I understood that there were different levels of torment. I don't know what level I was in, but I understood there were different degrees of punishment and levels of torment. Now, you remember Jesus said, you shall receive the greater damnation, Matthew 23, 14, inferring there's a lesser. Or he said, it shall be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in a day of judgment than for that city, inferring there's a less tolerable. Or Hebrews 10.28 says, of how much worse of a punishment supposed to be for you, you who have trodden underfoot the Son of God. Luke 12.47 talks about beaten with many stripes or beaten with you. Anyway, the point is, there is no comfortable, nice level in hell. They're all horrendous beyond anything you can ever imagine. I was so thirsty. Just a drop of water would have been so precious like the rich man. I felt like if you were to imagine running through the Sahara Desert for a month with cotton in your mouth, I desperately wanted a drop of water. But you never get that drop. And you know, here, if I was to give you a drop of water, what would that do for you? Nothing, right? Be of no value, one drop. But in hell it would be. That's why when, after this happened, I came back, um, the first thing I did was ask for a glass of water. And when I saw it, you know, I said, wow, that's life in a glass. That's life in a glass. Because, see, Revelation 21.6 equates water with life, right? And it was so beautiful to see life contained in one glass. The smells in hell are so foul and putrid and disgusting, worse than anything you can ever imagine. Like uh, the worst open sewer, bad eggs, rotten milk, everything, again, times a thousand. But also add to it sulfur. And sulfur is actually toxic to breathe. If you go to Hawaii, to the volcano, they have signs posted where you can't go past a certain point because the toxicity coming up from the volcano, the sulfur, will kill you. Well, that's what you're breathing in hell. Well, you, you don't have enough air to breathe in hell. You have to fight and gasp for even the tiniest bit of air. And maybe only an asthma patient can relate to this, but I'll demonstrate to you, this is how you breathe in hell. It was like... That's as much air as you could get. So any moment you felt like, I'm going to die, I don't have enough oxygen. But you keep going. But see, Isaiah 42, 5 says, the Lord gives breath to the people upon the earth. You're not upon the earth. You're down beneath the earth. God's real specific with his word. So you don't derive that benefit again. Uh, you need to sleep in hell. For all eternity, you never get to go to sleep. Revelation 14, 11 says, and the smoke of their torment ascends up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night. Now, that primarily means no rest from the torments, but no rest of any kind. Because Isaiah 57, 20 says, the wicked are like the troubled sea that cannot rest. But see, again, that's a blessing and benefit from God because Psalms 127, 2 says, the Lord gives His beloved sleep. You're not His beloved there. You have no purpose, no destiny. Ecclesiastes 9, 10 says, there's no work, no device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in Sheol. It's just a complete useless wasting away. And it doesn't matter who you are. If you're somebody famous here, no one would know who you are there. You're completely lost and alone. Ecclesiastes 6.4 says your name is covered in darkness. So no one would know who you are. And you're forgotten in hell. Psalms 88.12, 
Isaiah 26, 14, no one would remember you in hell. And it's confusion and turmoil in hell. It's just everything is confusion. You know, we like things in order here and neat in order. Well, hell's the opposite. Jeremiah 20, 11 and Isaiah 45, 16 talk about everlasting confusion. And Job 10, 22 talks about a land without any order. These are all the things that, that hell's like. And there were snakes of all sizes and shapes. Some of the demons were 12 and 13 feet tall. Uh, there were maggots everywhere. Millions of maggots crawling. I could only see a little bit from the light from the flames, but it illuminated enough for me to see the ground that was covered solid with maggots. And you know, I learned this from John MacArthur's teaching on hell, but um, you know, first of all, Isaiah 14, 11 says, where the maggot will be spread under thee and will cover thee. It uses the word maggot in the original. And John MacArthur said that, you know, if an animal, a dead animal, I know this is disgusting, but just bear with me. If a dead animal is being eaten by maggots, well, when the flesh is consumed, the maggots will die. And I never knew that, but when the flesh is fully consumed, the maggots will die. Well, that's why Jesus said, where their worm dies not and the fire is not quenched. It's also the word maggot. You see, so in other words, the flesh is never fully consumed, so the maggot feeds sweetly on thee. As it says in Job 24.20. I mean, is that disgusting enough? The fear level that you have to experience in hell is so far beyond anything you can imagine. You know, and I'll relate to you an experience that I had. I used to surf when I was 16 uh, a lot. And I was surfing off the coast of Cocoa Beach, Florida. A bunch of guys were out. And a shark came by and grabbed the guy next to me and ripped his leg off. And the shark came back. There was about... 30 sharks probably and 100 guys out we were scrambling trying to get to the beach and the shark passed by me and I got up on my knees and I was on a nine foot board and the shark was longer than my board and the paper said they were tiger sharks you know anything about sharks they're really vicious and the shark passed by turned his head and I saw his teeth were about this long and his mouth was about that wide and he passed by and he came back and he bit my board in half anyway the shark came back and grabbed my leg and pulled me down under the water now you can imagine the fear that I felt, right? Well, that fear paled in comparison to what you feel in hell. That wouldn't even register. You know, Psalm 73, 18 and 19 says, you cast them down into destruction where they are utterly consumed with terrors. Anyway, the shark let me go. Praise God. That's a miracle of God, right? to let me go I and mean, then open its mouth and I didn't even have a mark in my leg can you imagine that's a miracle of God not one mark and that's impossible with any shark but especially a tiger shark God was watching over me you know and I was not even a Christian then but I got saved immediately after that so <laughs> that's God that's God thank you Lord I thought about my wife you know, my wife and I were really close, and I thought about her, and I knew I would never get out. I would never see her again. I could never talk to her again. She would never know where I was at even. Job 7, 9 says, He that goeth down to Sheol shall come up no more. Matthew 18, 34 talks about being delivered to the tormentors. Psalms 50, verse 22, You that forget God, I will tear you in pieces. Matthew 24, 51, I will cut them in pieces where there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Psalms 116.3 says, The pains of Sheol got hold upon me. I found trouble and sorrow. Job 33.22, and I could go on. Psalm 74.20 says, For the dark places of the earth are full of the habitations of cruelty. And the word cruelty there is the word Hamas. We've heard that word before, haven't we? The word Hamas means, if you look it up in the Strongs, it means um, violence, ruthlessness, destruction, cruel hatred. And the demons hate you. You never get to see your loved ones. Even though you saw people all in that pit of fire all close together, it's not like that in reality. You're all kept apart and isolated. See, there's pleasure in being with somebody, right? And having conversation. You don't get to do that in hell. You're kept in the dark and isolated for all eternity. But you keep living because our soul is eternal. God made us in His image so our soul can't die. It lives on for eternity no matter what you do to it. And uh, you know, you might say, but Bill, why is hell so horrible? Well, I want to explain something. First of all, Matthew 25, 41, 
uh, Jesus said that hell was prepared for the devil and his angels. Well, the word prepared there is the same word he used in John 14 too, where he goes to prepare a place for us in heaven. And in that preparation, what God did was he withdrew his attributes from hell. You see, James 1.17 said, every good and perfect gift comes down from above, from the Father of lights. So God prepared a place. He just withdrew his attributes. Because, see, hell is dark because 1 John 1.5 says God is light. There's only death in hell because John 1.4 said God is life. There's only hatred in hell because 1 John 4.16 said God is love. There's no mercy in hell because Psalms 36.5 said the mercy of the Lord is in the heavens. There's no strength in hell because Psalms 18.32 said the Lord gives us strength. There's no water in hell because Psalms 18, uh, Deuteronomy 11.11 says water is the rain of heaven. And there's no peace in hell because Isaiah 9.6 says he is the prince of peace. So you see, remove God from the situation or he removes himself and all the good goes with him. But if you want nothing to do with God, you want to deny him, there is a place prepared that has nothing to do with him. I began being raised up this tunnel. And suddenly, all of a sudden, this bright light showed up. I knew immediately who it was. I didn't have to ask. And I just said, Jesus. And he said, I am. It was a bright light like I've never seen a light like this before. I only saw the outline of a man. I didn't see his face. And when he said, I am, I just fell at his feet. And I felt like I died. I can only explain that through Revelation 1.16, where John, when he saw him, it says his countenance was bright as the sun. And I fell at his feet as one dead. He touched me, and I came to. And I was at his feet. And it was there that I realized, even though I've known this all my years as a Christian, but it really hit me so strongly that because he went to the cross, I didn't have to go to that place. I was so grateful for the cross. If he wouldn't have gone, all of us would be there. Every one of us. I was so thankful. All I wanted to do was say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I didn't want to ask him any questions. I just wanted to worship him. But thoughts started coming in my mind after a time. And he would answer my thoughts. Psalms 139.2 says he answers our thoughts afar off. And I thought, Lord, why did you send me to this horrible place? And he said, because many people do not believe hell is real. He said, even some of my own people do not believe hell exists. And I thought, don't all Christians believe in hell? But they don't. A lot of Christians are even misled. And he wanted me to go and tell people. Because a lot of the churches aren't teaching the truth about hell. And he doesn't want anybody to go there. He didn't make it for man, like Pastor said. Matthew 25, 41. Hell was prepared for the devil and his angels. But man will go there if he chooses to reject the only provision for our sin, which is Jesus Christ. And I thought, Lord, why did those demons hate me so much? He said, because you're made in my image and they hate me. Remember John 15, 18, Jesus said they hated me before they hated you. And we're made in God's image, Genesis 1.26. All the evil we see in the world today, sickness, disease, cancer, all that, that all comes from the demonic realm. I was so aware of that when I was in hell. I looked at those demons and I, that's where cancer and all this comes from. It's not from God. People blame God falsely. Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Satan has come to kill, steal, and destroy. That's where the evil comes from on the earth, not from God. He's the giver of life. And I thought, Lord, why didn't you pick me? He didn't give me an answer. So I have no idea why he would have picked me. You know, I was not a Billy Graham. I just was a realtor going to work like everybody else every day. You know, and I, I like everything neat and clean and perfect and hell is the antithesis, you know. Uh, I know we all do, but I'm like a fanatic about these things. And, and um, I mean, I don't even like the summertime. That's too hot for me, you know. But I don't, it doesn't matter why he picked me. You know, he's given us all a job to do. Everyone has a job to do for the Lord. And no one is more important than anybody else. 
we're all equally as important. And you know, I was uncomfortable for seven years giving this testimony, extremely uncomfortable. And I complained. And the Lord said to me, Bill, it's not about you being comfortable. It's about you being obedient. I said, Lord, I don't want to tell anybody about this experience. They're going to think I'm crazy or had a bad dream. And he said, it's not your job to convict their hearts. It's the Holy Spirit's job. You just go and tell them. And I said, Lord, why didn't I know you? Why didn't I know you?